kill it. Sikorsky? Was I close? Okay. <laughs> I really tried on my, my hardest. And Thank he's you. gonna be talking about becoming a hybrid work HR leader via behavioral science. So I'm really super excited to hear what you have to say. So with that, Dr. Gleb, it's all yours. Thank you so much. I appreciate that kind introduction. All right, everyone. So let's talk about hybrid work. This is the topic of the year. So many people are focusing on how to do hybrid work well. When you look at the research, about 74% of large companies are transitioning to a permanent hybrid work model. And many, many smaller companies as well. We don't have as good statistical data on smaller companies, but SHRM research shows that 74% of larger companies are transitioning to that. And so the future looks pretty clearly to be hybrid. But the question is, how do you lead people effectively? How do you manage people effectively in a hybrid model, especially for you as HR leaders? Because you are often the ones tasked with implementing these models. So I helped 21 companies figure out their hybrid work models, transition to hybrid work. And what I often see is that the leadership, the C-suite makes a decision and then they put it into the lack of HR to figure it out. They're like, okay, we want to do hybrid work. Now HR, figure it out. And that's difficult for HR because you don't really have the experience and expertise and the background to actually implement the hybrid work model. It's new for everyone. So that's what we're going to be talking about here today. How do you address some of these problems? Now, uh, something to mention is that if you are on the call, if you're on the video conference call, if you put in your name, you registered, then you'll get the, my book after this presentation and the other resources from this presentation. If you're watching the recording later or if somehow you weren't able to register normally, then you should go to the website that's under my me right now. So in the graphics, so tinyurl.com forward slash DAE event. Again, tinyurl.com forward slash DAE event. And just put in your information and you'll get my book and other resources from this presentation. All right, without further ado, let's talk about how we think about hybrid work. But before talking about hybrid work, let's talk about other forms of decision. So right now we're having lunch, let's say you go to your fridge and you open it up and you see that, hey, for lunch, I'm gonna have an option of two types of ice cream. One that has 10% fat. So it says contains 10% fat. And another that says 90% fat free. So 90% fat free. So 10% fat or 90% fat free. Which of these sounds more appealing to you? We're gonna do a little poll and see which one you prefer. So would you prefer ice cream that's 90% fat free or contains 10% fat? Please go ahead and vote. So I see most of us participated. Let's give five more seconds for those who haven't participated yet. All right, so we see that just over a third would prefer 90% fat free, just over a third would prefer 10% fat, and just under a third would have no preference. But if we think about it, 10% fat means it's 90% fat free, right? 90% fat free means it's 10% fat. But it really feels to us like there's a difference. Some people prefer 90% fat free, some people prefer 10% fat. So the last large majority of us prefer those a smaller, much smaller minority has no preference. So clearly the way the information is presented to us shapes our decision-making. So this is called the framing effect, the framing effect. So think about how the information is presented to you because that will really powerfully influence your decision-making. So what is the frame around hybrid work, around remote work in your company, in your organization, in your context? The way that you frame the issue to yourself, to your employees, to your leadership will very much influence the decisions and 
the behaviors that come from this issue. So thinking about framing is really important because when we're thinking about hybrid work, remote work, there are lots of, there's a great deal of opportunity to have benefits from it. But there's a lot of challenges with it. So you hear phrases like people are our greatest resource. So leaders often say people are our greatest resource. But many don't really live by that principle when they approach hybrid and remote work because they're comfortable. They like traditional office culture and they really want to get back to the office. They want to turn back the clock and they deny the reality that there was a really big major disruption. And so their framing of hybrid work is through the lens of January 2020. And they're not really seeing that many, many employees are not seeing eye to eye with leaders. So that is a really big challenge that HR is facing because when I consult for companies, I inevitably see that HR gets kind of in the middle between the workers who want to spend more time working remotely and leaders who almost always want to spend, want their employees to spend more time in the office. And so you need to mediate that challenge. And how you do it is to focus on business outcomes. So that's where I think HR can make the real difference, focusing on business outcomes, which are productivity, retention, cost cutting, engagement. Those are the business outcomes. And so you need to help leaders and employees alike put aside default assumptions, habits, and preferences, and focus on those business objectives, on those outcomes, and not what's personally comfortable. And especially for leaders who are going to be have more of the power, right? they often don't realize that what they're saying, oh, everyone needs to come back to the office or something like that. It's what makes them personally comfortable, but it actually harms business outcomes like productivity, retention, and so on. So that is definitely important. And the same thing, of course, for employees who want to work remotely. They don't realize that that can sometimes undercut collaboration, innovation, and so on. So you want to overcome the dangerous judgment errors called cognitive biases about the future of work and integrate best practices on high innovative work arrangements. I'll be talking about, so that's the shape of the presentation. The first part of the presentation will deal with some data about hybrid work, remote work preferences. We'll talk about some of the errors that people, leaders, individuals often make around hybrid work and remote work. And then we'll talk about some best practices for how to implement hybrid work arrangements. All right, without further ado, let's get to the data. Now, there are eight major independent surveys, in the, including conducted by SHRM, by Harvard Business School, these large organizations that don't have a stake in the outcome that show pretty clearly that the large majority of all workers, 75 to 85%, depending on the survey, don't want traditional office-centric work. So these are all people, of course, who are remote capable. So they don't want traditional remote work, uh, traditional office-centric work. A large proportion, from a quarter to a third, want full-time remote work, so pretty strong proportion. And 40 to 55% reported they would leave their job if forced to come in full-time. And we know that plenty of people have left their jobs as that's part of the great resignation. A major driver of the great resignation has been people leaving their jobs because they're forced to come in. And over 70% would be less likely to leave if offered substantial remote work, so at least half the work week or more. Now, another thing that to remember, this remote work drives productivity. We have very clear data that remote workers are overall more productive. So we have surveys, 55, for example, 55% report higher productivity, 15% report lower productivity. So 30% report the same productivity, and that's from a number of surveys. Now, that's not only from surveys though. We have data from employee monitoring software like Promodope or like Protoscore showing that remote staff are 5% more productive. So actually hard data from employee monitoring software showing that remote staff are actually more productive. And we have research, peer-reviewed research. So the Stanford University study that showed that in May 2020, remote staff were on average 5% more productive than in-office staff. But that productivity increased by May 2022. They, they became 9% more productive than in-office staff. Why is that? And this is, of course, for similar roles. Now, why is that? Why were they more productive? Well, because they were more capable 
we, there were more investments into the technology over these two years after the shutdowns. People learned how to work together better in remote settings, how to collaborate better in remote settings. Leaders learned how to lead better. Governments, utilities created better support for technology, better laws, of course, you know, compliance and all that was adjusted to enable remote work. So remote work became more efficient over time. So it's quite a bit more efficient than it used to be by now. Now, we also know that remote and hybrid employees have better well-being. So they have better well-being. That's very clearly established. Over 75% feel less stressed. Over 70% feel better well-being. Over 75% feel happier. So despite the fact that there is more social isolation for remote workers overall, they have less burnout, better well-being, better mental states. Now, I'd like to take a poll before going forward about you. Which do you think would be for you your preferred working style? So please go ahead and vote. See over half of you participated. Let's give you five more seconds to the rest who hasn't who haven't participated yet. Okay, so here we have a clear winner two days uh, a week in the office among HR staff. So yes, when I talk to HR staff, it tends to be the case that HR staff want to have one to two days a week in the office would be the average. So good. So you should know that that's the, the vast majority of you would not, just like the worker, other workers, the vast majority of you would want to spend more than half the week at home. <laughs> All right. Now, let's talk about some of the errors that folks often make around hybrid work and remote work. And these are called cognitive biases. So cognitive biases are the decision-making errors we make because of how our mind is wired. They stem from a revolutionary background. They stem from the structure of our brain. I can go into it in the Q&A. That's my expertise in behavioral science. But I'm going to talk specifically about how they are relevant to hybrid and remote work here. So these are errors. One of the biggest problems is called the status quo bias. So we stand, our minds tend to prefer the status quo that we perceive as normative, as right, as proper. And so what you see, this desire to maintain or get back to the status quo is a downplaying of major disruption from the pandemic and a desire to get back to January, 2020. And that especially happens among people who are more senior, who are experienced, and those are, of course, in leadership, people who are in leadership positions, because that is the status quo that they know, that they are comfortable with, that they're familiar with, that they feel empowered by, they feel good about. And so you often see leaders trying to get people to come to the office more, spend more time than employees want to spend in the office, and then would be aligned with business objectives because leaders feel comfortable in that environment. They feel that's the status quo, and they feel that they don't know how to be successful in more remote settings and hybrid settings. So that's a big challenge that I often see with leaders and that HR, have to, HR has to mediate among the leadership and employees around this challenging issue. Another one is called the empathy gap. The empathy gap. So that's where we underestimate the way that emotions, the strength of emotions in other people. So emotions influence our decisions powerfully. About 80 to 90% of our decision-making is emotional. So it comes from our feelings, not the rational thoughts. And we don't realize that. We underestimate that. And leaders do, everyone does. So there are many, many people who during the pandemic developed a strong commitment employees to flexibility, to well-being, to health, and they're not willing to sacrifice that to go back to the status quo of January 2020. 
And leaders greatly underestimate this. So they really underestimate the way that people are much, much more committed to flexibility and well-being than they were. And even though we are going into a more troubled economic environment, clearly the labor market is still very tight, as you as HR professionals know that very well. And so employees still have the power to leverage their desire for flexibility and well-being. So if we look at, let's say, flexibility, that is the topmost desire after career and payment for employees. So when you look at employee surveys, that's more important to employees than retirement. That's more important to employees than healthcare. That's more important to employees than all sorts of other perks. Only career progression of, and payment salary are more important than flexibility. And when we think about flexibility, it's not nearly as well developed as, let's say, retirement offerings or healthcare offerings. Even though retirement and healthcare are quite a bit less important to employees, according to what employees report, than flexibility. And so that's really important for us to understand where there's not nearly enough emphasis being placed on what employees actually care about. <laughs> now, the next one I want to talk about is functional fixedness. Functional fixedness. When we learn one way of functioning, we tend to become stuck in that way. It's kind of like the hammer nail syndrome. When you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And so when we perceive only one right way of functioning, one right way, let's say, of how do we collaborate? How do we lead? How do we innovate? How do we manage people? How do we work together? Then we tend to shoehorn these office-centric methods of working into hybrid work and remote work. And that's a problem because hybrid work is very different than office-centric work. And it's also different than remote work. You need to figure out methods of managing people, leading people, coordinating people, that innovating on projects, problem solving, that are going to be adapted to the environment of hybrid work. But unfortunately, too few leaders do that. So they transpose this office-based culture on hybrid and remote work and fail to adapt strategically to innovate and collaborate effectively. Now, I'm curious what you think about which of these cognitive biases might be the most problematic for your workplace. So please go ahead and vote. Two thirds of you voted. Let's give five more seconds. Okay, so status quo bias clearly is the winner. So just over a half of you believe that that's the biggest problem. And then empathy gap and functional fixedness are at a quarter each. Good, good to know that. And now that you know about these cognitive biases, you can take the next steps to educate people about them and address them. All right. So let's talk about some of the best practices. So we talked about some of the data on what employees actually want. We talked about the decision-making errors that everyone tends to make around hybrid and work and remote work. But how do you actually do hybrid work and remote work effectively? How do you do hybrid work effectively? That's what we focus on. So what are the best practices? The best practice is a team-led model. So team-led model is very clearly what works best for hybrid work. So hybrid first and with a minority remote, that is the best modality. Why is that the best modality? Well, because it gives you the best in combination of engagement, worker satisfaction, and productivity. So we, there are a number of surveys and research papers that show that when teams make the decision about who should come to the office and how often, then they have higher engagement, higher productivity, higher motivation, and higher, better collaboration outcomes. And it kind of makes sense, you know, the CEO at the top, when 
they say he or she says you know come in three days a week you know month you know, like apple says tuesday wednesday and thursday or something like that well different teams need different time in the office because the only reason to come into the office is to do collaboration right when you look at productivity outcomes productivity outcomes it's very clear that you should do the majority of your work at home because the majority of the work for almost all employees is going to be focused work so work like working on reports you don't need the distraction of the office to work on the reports working like let's say doing emails people spend an average of two hours a day on their email you don't need to be in the office to do emails video conference meetings you do not need to be in the office to do a video conference meeting that's kind of waste of time of going to the office for two hours commuting and then doing a video conference meeting and the large majority of time for employees is taken up by focused work by communicate asynchronous communication like email and video conference meetings those kind th those are the kinds of activities that is much better done at home people are much more productive comfortable less distractions so very clearly the other things that people need to do in the office are collaborative activities most of the collab more intense collaborative activities are professional development collaboration are better done in the office and we'll talk about more of them so the team is the one who should be making the decision around how often and when they should come to the office so they can coordinate around collaboration with the people who need to co collaborate so hybrid employees should be spending around one to two days in the office that's what we see that's going to be the majority 70 to 90 percent so that should be for the companies that I helped transition 21 companies that was the clear outcome and then fully remote employees now there are going to be some people who are going to be successful at being fully remote and you want to have some people who are fully remote if they're really passionate about it and if they could be successful doing it also if they are more individual contributors if they really need to intensely collaborate with others and those others are going to be present in the office it's going to be hard for them to be fully successful working remotely some of them might be so it could be more of a case by case basis but you want to be thinking about are they more individual contributors or are they really big really important in terms of team players so you also want to provide people with training. People need to get trained on effective hybrid work and remote work because they don't know how to do it, effective hybrid work. They need to know what to do in the office, what to do at home. And we can talk in the Q&A about these things, what to do in the office and what to do at home. So there's definitely things that you might not fully think about that can be done best in each place. And they also want to be train them on effective virtual and hybrid communication and collaboration so for example hybrid meetings where some people are in the room and some people are remote those can be very challenging and there can be many many problems with hybrid meetings and people need to be trained on how to do those effectively even virtual communication like we're having right now in zoom meetings there are many ways that people can be trained to have zoom meetings Microsoft team meetings better than they do. There's so much money being spent on communication training, which focuses on in-person communication and not nearly enough resources being spent on virtual communication, even though that's clearly the future, especially as more technology gets developed, which allows even more effective virtual communication. Now, so this is a team-led model. And I want to share with you a video of someone who implemented this team led model you should be able to see the screen now and this is so uh, this is one of my clients from the university of southern california information sciences institute and this is a 400 people information cybersecurity and ai research institute and so Dr. Craig Knobloch is the executive director, and he will share about his experience implementing this team-led hybrid first model. Let's hear what he has to say. Uh, Gleb Zabersky came, came to my attention sometime back during the pandemic when uh, I was planning to have our research institute uh, follow the standard path that all the big corporations are following. So Apple and Google were announcing plans to have people come back three days a week. So I thought that seems like a good plan. So we actually sent out a message said, okay, starting this date, everyone's coming back three days a week. Uh, and then, you know, can work from home two days a week. 
Uh, and, and then I saw a video that Cleb actually, a video talk that Cleb actually gave for IEEE uh, that really actually changed my mind about this. And it was a video about hybrid work and how important it was to actually embrace it. And, uh, uh, and one of the things I was impressed in the video is that all these interesting ideas about how to make hybrid work more effective and stuff. So I signed up for a meeting with Gleb and uh, uh, learned quite a bit more about you know, how to do hybrid work well. And so Gleb has come on as a consultant for the Information Science Institute and has been really helpful in terms of putting us much more in a leadership position in terms of figuring out how to do hybrid work. So we changed our policies. We are much more flexible about who can work at home and, and allowing people to work from home, you know, whatever makes sense with respect to their supervisor, uh, creating spaces in people's home offices, uh, figuring out how to onboard people in a way that, you know, when people haven't met in person, that is more effective. Uh, so I think he's been incredibly helpful in terms of really transitioning us to be a, sort of a lead in, in how we manage hybrid work at the, at the Institute. So it's been incredibly useful with all of Club's advice, and I appreciate all the help he's given us with respect to moving forward with this, our hybrid work plans. Okay, given that, what are your thoughts about implementing in your workplace the steam led approach? Please go ahead and vote. How valuable do you think it would be? Okay, see about half of you participated. Let's give five more seconds for those who didn't yet. Okay, great. Over three quarters of you see it as highly valuable. That's excellent. So you'll be able to take the information and implement it quick, pretty quickly and effectively. Good. Now, Let's talk about two challenges I often hear about hybrid work that gives people hesitation about implementing the team-led model, implementing some of the best practices with hybrid work. And one of them is collaboration. So how do you do collaboration and team building in hybrid settings? Well, what you want to do is replacing this in-person co-working with you know, when people work together in an open office space with virtual co-working. And here's what virtual co-working means. It's working along team members on a video conference call. So much like this one, you get in a video conference call, you dial in, and it's for fully virtual teams. So if you have a remote team or hybrid teams on their non-office days, so every day that you're not in the office, dial into a video conference call for, for an hour. So it's an hour-long video conference call. And you start by sharing on what you plan to work. And this takes about a minute or two where everyone just shares about what they plan to work on. And this is going to be their individual projects. This is not a collaborative project. This is not something that you talk to other people on. So this is your individual projects that you want to work on, your reports, your emails, whatever you want to do. Then you turn off your microphones. You, like all of you did, so thank you for keeping your microphones off. You leave your speakers on and your video can be optional. So you can leave it on, you can leave it off. You see here that some folks are leaving it on, some pe people are leaving it off. Then as you work on your tasks, you know, work for your emails, work on your reports, you know, go through your compliance documents. If you have some questions that you have for other team members, if you have some ideas for improvements, some innovations, you turn on your microphone and you share them. And then teammates then answer your questions, they, they help solve problems, brainstorm some ideas about the innovation, whatever it might be. And that is how the hour is spent. And then you uh, turn off your microphone and go back. So you end by everyone sharing what you accomplished during this period. So you turn on your microphones and you share, okay, this is what I did during this period, and that's all. So this is a very motivating activity, an engaging activity, where you get a sense of connection to your team members. You're working on a shared task, even though you're working separately from each other remotely. It helps teams bond quite a bit. And it's especially helpful for innovation. So get ideas, problem solving, 
and it's very good for junior team members. So one of the big problems that one of my clients is a Fortune 200 high-tech manufacturer called Applied Materials and who also allowed me to talk about their work, my work for them. And they hired something like 16,000 new people during the pandemic. So they had to have a lot, they had a lot of problems with integrating junior people. So if you want to integrate junior people, this is a really good methodology, virtual co-working. So that's how do you solve collaboration problems? Another challenge that I often hear is innovation. How do you do effective innovation in hybrid settings and remote settings? Well, what you want to do is replace the traditional synchronous brainstorming with virtual and asynchronous brainstorming. The big benefit, of course, of working remotely is the ability to work more asynchronously. And that provides you with a lot of opportunities to be creative and innovative asynchronously. So traditional brainstorming is when people get together in a room and they start sharing ideas, and it's quite useful. There's definitely benefits to it. People, there are a couple of benefits. One of the benefits is called synergy, where when you have an idea that's inspired by an idea that somebody else shared, and you wouldn't have had your idea without the other person sharing their idea. And there's also something called social facilitation, where you are inspired and motivated by other people being in the same room, working on the same thing. But traditional brainstorming, we know that from extensive research in behavioral science has had a lot of problems for, we know from that research long before remote work, has serious problems. One of them is called production blocking. So production blocking, that refers to when you have an idea, but other people are talking about a different idea and you don't have you, you, they're steering the conversation in a different direction and you have trouble interrupting them and you lose track of your idea. That, pretty, that happens pretty often. Evaluation apprehension is another one. So evaluation apprehension is where you're worried about sharing a too out of the box idea or criticizing another team member implicitly by sharing an idea that you know, goes against the, their domain or something like that. So production blocking tends to be a particular problem for people who are introverts and people who are juniors on the junior status members on the team. Evaluation apprehension is also a problem for junior status team members, and it's also a problem for people who are more pessimistically inclined, so personality-wise. Social loafing is a problem for everyone. It's when there are more people, the more people that are in the room, the less our brain wants to work. So we have, it's just what the research suggests, our brain is inherently lazy, uh, which is understandable in the savannah environment because it needed to conserve energy. And so right now we don't really want to work hard. And the more people that are in the room, the less incentive we have to work hard. And so the, that causes the more people that are in the room, the less number of ideas you have per person. Virtually synchronous brainstorming is a methodology that was actually developed a long time ago that's developed that's based on the methodology that was developed in the early 1990s to address production blocking, evaluation apprehension, social loafing. And I adapted this methodology to hybrid and remote work. So you can see my Harvard, Harvard Business Review article about it. It's especially helpful, as you can guess, for junior and lower status team members introverts, and pessimists. Let's talk about how it works. So there are three steps for virtually synchronous brainstorming. The first step, all team members create ideas and input them asynchronously and anonymously. So asynchronously, not at the same time, and anonymously without other people explicitly knowing what they are. You can use many things for this. So you can use Google Forms. So let's say I often do Google Forms when I facilitate this, so give everyone a Google Forms where, where they can submit their ideas. And then you can have optionally a field for names that would be visible only to the leader if you want that, if you want people to be able to get credit for their ideas from the leader. And you can also choose to skip that. It depends on the structure of the, of the poll. You can also use... MS Forms, so if you're an MS organization, Microsoft organization, you can use Mural. That's a nice whiteboarding solution if you want to do something more visual. Now, that's ink synchronicity. You can do this for quickly over 10, 15 minutes, 
or you can do this over an hour, or you can do this over days, or you can do this over weeks. And so that's very helpful because introverted people can work on this without production blocking. And so can lower status team members work on this without production blocking. So there's no problem with being blocked by what other people are sharing. The anonymity is very helpful for people who are pessimistic and lower status team members. So they can fully participate and you can get the benefits of these team members whose ideas really never came to fruition fully before. The people who are pessimistic, people who are introverted, people who are junior status team members, they didn't get the benefits of actual brainstorming previously. So you only had a small subset of ideas. Now, step two, all team members anonymously comment on and evaluate each idea. So you can have a number of criteria for evaluations, like how innovative, practical, and exciting it is. Those are default baselines when I facilitate, but you can create any other categories. So you can have some a zero for five rating for each idea. So let's say you have, there are six people and you have a Google Forms, you get spreadsheets from the Google Forms, you give it to each of these people. And so now they rate each of these ideas. Let's say there are 40 ideas. And you, they rate each of these ideas from zero to five on each of these categories. And so now you have each idea has six people rating them zero for five. So up, up to 15 per person. So that's going to be up to 90 per person. And so you have now 40 ideas that are, um, that are rated anywhere from zero to 90 because you have again six people who can give up to 15 points per each idea and so now you can pretty clearly see which ideas are going to be floating to the top right so you can see that the rate the ideas that are going to be let's say 75 and above are the ones that you're going to be focusing on and then you'll have a synchronous meeting then you'll determine how to implement the best ideas so that's the time for a synchronous meeting so meeting you can do this in person, but so if you're going to be a hybrid team, or you can do this virtually if you're a fully remote team. I recommend doing it in person if you're a hybrid team, because one of the good things to do in the office is collaboration to synchronize on ideas. So collaboration, that's a good place to, good thing to do in the office. So these are the steps for virtually synchronous brainstorming. Now, I want to share with you a different video. All right, so this is Susan Winchester. She's the Chief Human Resource Officer at Applied Materials, which you might've seen in the news. It's a Fortune 200 high-tech manufacturing company in the semiconductor industry. And she's going to tell us a little bit about virtually synchronous brainstorming. Hi, I'm Susan Winchester, and it's my delight and pleasure to tell you a little bit about our experience with Dr. Gleb. He had a big positive impact at Applied Materials. Our leaders and engineers love data-based, research-based insights, which is exactly what he brings. He hit it out of the park. And he used a team-led process, which was incredibly engaging. He introduced us to a concept he created called asynchronous brainstorming. It was a process that we used with hundreds and hundreds of leaders globally at the same time. We did this during our CEO kickoff session for our strategy work. And in a very short amount of time, we were able to get great benefits. I also love the work he's doing to educate leaders around the power and positive benefits of hybrid and virtual working. And one of his techniques that I'm planning to use, because I think it's so cool, is what he calls virtual co-working, where you and as many work co-workers, colleagues as you'd like, create a virtual meeting and no purpose or agenda, but rather just to be working with one another. So I highly endorse Dr. Gleb's work. Love him. Okay, great. So that's Susan's experience with virtual co-working. Now, let's get to the key takeaways that I want to share with you on the skin inflection that we're going through on the future of work. So you want to integrate addressing decision-making cognitive biases into the culture of your organization. You want to focus on business outcomes, help the leaders and employees alike focus on business outcomes despite some personal discomfort. 
and use the steam light hybrid first model with a minority fully remote. You'll get retention of best talent, improving productivity, maximizing well-being, and addressing burnout, reducing costs, and so on. And adapt your culture. Address the functional fixedness. Adapt your culture to hybrid work, to remote work. So training. You want to train people on what they should do in, at home and in the office. You want to integrate virtual co-working. That's going to be a really useful technique to facilitate collaboration for team building and integrating junior staff and virtually synchronous brainstorming. It will help with innovation and problem solving. Now it's up to you. I believe you can go out there and make it happen. And I look forward to any questions that you have about how to help you make it happen. Now, the three additional resources I mentioned are tinyurl.com forward slash DA event. There's going to be a copy of my best-selling book, Leading Hybrid and Remote Teams, and a free coaching session for the first three claimants. All right. So go on, check it out, and I will be happy to answer any questions right now. Let's see. I see a few questions came in while I was talking. So Deborah asks, uh, if the use of the microphone during co-working time is distracting to the group. Yes, of course. So it's definitely going to be distracting when somebody turns on their microphone and asks something. But you anticipate that this is the activity, right? Just like you're in the office and you anticipate when you're working in an open office that someone can ask a question about something, right? So of course, they're going to be distracting, but that's the nature of the beast. And how to decide if some or all of the group will stop working to answering questions. Yeah, I, this, this just happens very naturally. People, you know, whoever has, people want to help, as you know, people like to share about their expertise. So if they want, if they have, have an answer, they'll naturally turn on their microphone, they'll answer, they'll chat, somebody else will chime in. It, it's a good discussion. Let's see, maybe distracting for others thinking. Yeah, so this, of course, like I said, it is distracting, but people anticipate that during this hour-long activity, there would be some distractions, just like you anticipate being distracted in the open office. Stephen asks, introverted people often request to have a camera off, but it's always frustrating for those who have their cameras on. Thoughts? So what I recommend is that you have your camera on when you speak, and you also have your camera on for more intense meetings when it's important to see people's responses to questions. Now, for situations where you don't need to see people's responses to, to questions, to comments, meaning you're not making an important decision, you're just reporting something or you're sharing information, where it's not so, so important to have people's faces because you're not trying to gauge their responses, then you should really not be draining the energy of introverted people because introverted people, their energy is drained. So you want to conserve that resource and use that resource wisely. So Stephen says, yeah, they would have to show their face. Of course they would. And that's a reason why plenty of them don't want to go to the office, right? <laughs> so, you know, you'll definitely see introverted people being more, pro having a bigger preference for spending more time remotely. And now they can, and you know, I mean, if you try to force them to do things that they don't want to do, they'll leave. So it's <laughs> Yes, Kiki. So I've always been intrigued with this um, disparity between turning cameras on, leaving cameras mm -hmm. off. Have you found that um, setting the expectations up front for cameras on has been an issue in the office mm -hmm. and for those people at home? If we set the expectation in advance, I, I think there's such value in seeing body mm -hmm. language. Have you found it to be yeah. helpful? I found, helpful? I found that compliance is a big problem. I'm Like I said, I, I helped 21 companies transition mm -hmm. and we find that compliance is a very serious issue because mm -hmm. it's just going to be um, not doable, <laughs> practically speaking, to for the leader of the meeting to you know stop every five minutes and say, Bob, turn your camera back on, you know, mm -hmm. and then 
you know, 10 minutes, Susan, turn your camera back on. Just people slowly fade out and they turn their cameras off. And it's just, it, it just becomes too much of a burden. So instead of mandating it in a way that just drains people, it's much more helpful to have certain contexts to say in this context, for this reason, you know, if people have a reason and they have, there's an understandable cause for certain contexts, you certainly don't need to have people's body language visible when it's just a typical meeting report, right? Where you, you're, you're reporting out information and so on. If, like I said, if it's a decision-making meeting where you, you need to see people's nuance and responses, that's important. So you want to think about what kind of activities are important. Let, let's say, I mean, a, a performance management review, of course, that's important. Right. So you want to talk about what kind of context. So what I do with my clients is we create etiquette. Instead of mandating, you know, always turn your camera on or something like that, we have kind of an etiquette policy. These are the kinds of contexts where you turn your camera on and then we announce this is the kind of context. So let's we're making a decision. Let's all turn our cameras on so we can see each other and respond to each other effectively. So that there's a reason for it. And introverts can see, okay, now this is worth the drain of my energy for this period of time. Thank you. I think we have to set those expectations even when we're in person, right? <laughs> <laughs> sure. This is when I need your participation. Sure. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions, thoughts, or comments for Dr. Gleb? Harlan put something in the chat. What other compliance issues do you face with hybrid work policies? Yeah, um, it's very difficult to enforce policies when people don't see a reason for them. So what you'll overwhelmingly see if you set a free day in the office policy and people find that they come to the office and they do exactly the same things that they would do at home that are better done at home, like video conference meetings. There's no reason to come to the office and do video conference meetings. The video conference meetings are much better done from home for the large majority, if it's not a group video conference meeting. So, because the office does have the group you know, you know, Zoom room or something like that. But if you're one doing video conference meetings one-on-one, -on -one, the large majority of people are much more comfortable doing them from home. There's much less distractions and so on. You know, people don't need to be in the office to do emails. <laughs> people don't need to be in the office to write reports. So what you'll find is that when people come to the office and they find that they're doing the same thing that they're doing from home, and then they're just feeling frustrated and angry and they stop coming to the office, except for the, th the things that make sense to do in the office, which is collaborative activities. And so those policies, what my clients, and I definitely had some clients who tried to set those policies, we just found that they were not workable in terms of actually enforcing them unless they were willing to you know, write people up and discipline them and fire them. And this is just kind of a silly reason to fire a really good worker <laughs> in this tight labor market. So it just ends up being ignored. And it's never great when you have a policy that, that is ignored because, you know, yeah, this is kind of a ignorable policy in, in the way that it doesn't hurt the company too much if a worker ignores it. But of course, that sets a precedent for ignoring other policies. So it's quite a bit more effective, we find, that to make a policy that's based on the kind of activities that people need to do and have an expectation that, hey, these are the activities that you'll be doing in the office. And these are the activities that you're welcome to do anywhere. You can come to the office if you do them. You know, we have something like an average of 15 or so percent of people who don't have comfortable enough office environment, home office environments that they prefer to come to the office to do email work and so on. But the large majority prefer to do that sort of stuff at home. And so that is where you'll find you'll have a really good balance and you'll have better employment, better employee engagement, better morale, more happiness, more retention, more productivity. There was another question from Michelle Cohn. Okay. You're welcome, Harland. Uh, do you think there's a loss of rapport with staff with fully remote and hybrid staff resulting in feeling less connected to the agency? Well, no. So we see that it's an interesting question. We see that when looking at the sense of connection, we see that fully remote people are a little bit less connected than people who are hybrid, but 
fully office-centric people are even less connected than fully remote people. And we're talking only about remote capable workers because they feel so much resentment about being office-centric. <laughs> so they feel just so much resentment that they feel even less connected than fully remote employees. The best sense of connection when you look at surveys, peer-reviewed research, is people who come in an average of one day a week. That provides more than sufficient sense of connection because you see people and you see your supervisor, that's your immediate sense of connection. You retain that a week, every week, but you don't come in for stuff that you perceive as needless in the office, like doing emails and so on. So that the strongest sense of connection comes from people coming in one day a week on average. You're welcome, Michelle. Other folks? I have one more question. Sure. <laughs> How do they handle the real estate issues if they're only coming in one day a week? And do you find that oh, picking the yeah. one day that everybody comes together is the best or everybody chooses their own? What have you found to be most helpful? Teams definitely choose their own. So having teams choose their own and uh, generally teams choose Tuesday, Wednesday or Thursday. Those kind of tend to be the default days you know, now shifting a little bit to yeah most people don't like mondays and fr fridays especially is bad so we're seeing that uh, the real estate is definitely less used and that allows my clients to let go of some of the real estate which is great <laughs> so that real estate tends to be the second or third biggest expense for businesses especially mm -hmm. service-based businesses it's usually the second ex biggest expense and so that helps them plan and reduce their real estate costs. That's wonderful. I mean, they're, they can immediately reduce them by cutting office-based services, like janitorial services, security, and so on, that they need less and you know, various other pro office-based products. And over the medium and long term, they are planning, and some of them already did cut their real estate. Of course, that also involves a separate conversation is needing to revise some of the existing real estate to facilitate more collaborative activities because that's what people mainly do in the office they collaborate they don't work on their individual tasks mm -hmm. anyone else i don't see any other questions in the chat did i miss anything I don't believe I so. Good. Yeah. How about we give another 10 seconds if anybody wants to unmute? Otherwise, mm -hmm. we are right on target for time. Thank you, Dr. Gleb. You're welcome. Yeah. So I see that you've put up uh, your information. So thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm going to give a, a big thank you on behalf of Liz Saida, our president, and thank you for your time. Uh, this has been a great presentation. We'd love having your contact information. And thank you, everyone, for joining us during this very busy time of year, uh, but for some awesome information. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Gleb. You're welcome. And I put my contact info for those who want to in the chat again, if you're watching this in video, go to tinyurl.com forward slash DAE event for the resources from this talk. All right, everyone. Have a great day. Enjoy your holidays. Thank you very much. Happy holidays, everyone. <laughs>